I'd like to say that this is a little more of a traditional private equity conversation, but you're not really your traditional private equity guy. Um, well, first of all, everyone, great to be here. Congratulations to Ron and the whole iConnections team. It's a pretty amazing turnout, uh, first time here. Um, I feel a lot of pressure, like I have big shoes to fill, or maybe giant shoes to fill, because Shaq was out here. <laughs> I've actually, Shaq and I just did a, sorry, Shaq and I just did a picture with Shanali in the middle. I think it's a keeper, actually. <laughs> the, um, but anyway, um, I think if by traditional you mean, you know, my, the jobs I had when I was younger, I was a, mostly a bouncer, a construction worker, I was a butcher for a bit. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess that would probably sound less conventional, although I'm not even sure anybody's story is really conventional. Well, if you were a bouncer and a butcher and you had worked in all these real economy jobs, do you think some, in some ways at the end of the day, it made you better at moving, frankly, from banking to owning businesses? I think that, um, I don't know. Um, I think not to spend a lot of time on me, but just a little bit of background. I, I think what you always really getting at is when, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in kind of an unusual household. Both my parents uh, suffered severe mental illness. My, uh, my mother suffered bipolar disorder, and my father uh, suffered extreme schizophrenia. In today's world, those diseases are, are handled better, but the, the medications are better, but the stigma is still uh, really significant. And so as a result, I had kind of a turbulent childhood. I didn't, you know, I, I went to Rutgers University, and, uh, but I didn't even get in the first time. Um, I think it was more the random walk of my experience on Wall Street. So I had a really fortunate career uh, at Citibank for nine years and then Goldman Sachs for 21. And I just ended up randomly moving around a lot. Um, I never really had a role for more than uh, four or five years. I think my longest role was actually the CFO of Goldman Sachs for five years. And so it really taught me a bit how to move because even within a firm, Within a great firm like Goldman Sachs, there's cultures within cultures. Banking is different than trading. And I think, I think I learned a bit about how to transition. Now, Carlisle, as a firm, you know, it's got such a storied history in finance. It's iconic. Um, what's happening in our business now, private markets, is pretty extraordinary in terms of the trajectory. That's why everybody's here, obviously. Um, and so, Making the move, the most important thing about making the move, Shanali, was understanding the context of the move. And by that I mean, whenever there's a succession challenge and you're a new CEO, you really need to understand what your position is in that role. And for me, it was really about understanding quite carefully, I was a new CEO, not known. I knew many of the LPs, I knew some of my partners, but it really had to invest the time to know my LPs around the world, and most importantly, to know my partners and my colleagues. Now, for those of you who don't know Harvey Schwartz, he had joined Carlisle almost a year ago. Yep. You are joining the industry at a time of, we could say, immense transformation, the whole industry, let alone Carlisle. And then you also come from this very, very non-traditional background. A lot of people in private equity have that Wharton pedigree, <laughs> and, they, and they rise to the top. And you didn't not only not just come from that, you also came from a banking rival. You came from Goldman Sachs. You were a banker. Yeah, well, they probably say Trader. more sales and trading, but it's okay. Yeah, but I came from Goldman Sachs. It is different. I think that, I think if you, Think about what's, what's happened in finance, let's say, over the last 30 or 40 years. There's, first of all, finance, you're all in finance. Um, we're all in the same industry. It's always dynamic. I think it's one of the things that attracted me most to it as a young person. Um, but if you think back over the last 30, 40 years, there have been these extraordinary trends which have driven it, and there will, be, there will continue to be very big trends. Some of those trends that we all grew up with, so I'm 59, I'm a lot older than many of you in the office. You know, I grew up in a, like a pretty remarkable time. I mean, a lot of unfortunate things happened in the world, but the geopolitical trend was incredibly favorable. 89, the Berlin Wall came down. Um, Cold War ended. Now we're in a proxy war with Russia. Um, interest rates went down. Inflation went down. Regulation was eased. Really, all the trends, broadly speaking, for decades have been mostly positive and friendly. And some of those trends are reversing, but some of the trends, specifically as it relates to what all of us do, are really powerful tailwinds. 
And if you think about three really obvious megatrends, one is the channel shift to wealth and the extension of these markets, the absolute growth of these markets, and the importance of providing private capital to enterprise around the world. That's a trend that's in place and will continue in place. When you think about what's happening with climate, which climate really is about energy transition, and when you think about what's happening in technology and AI, all these trends have really present huge opportunity for everyone in this room. So you're looking at the world entering a complicated phase, as you said, geopolitical risks now mounting in the surface. You spent the last year meeting hundreds of investors, more than 300 investors. That's true. What are they telling you? What are they most concerned about? So it's mixed. I would say, I'm going to answer that, but I would say the way I think about it is at a very high level, sort of when you think about risk and opportunity, I think about Again, this is an oversimplification, but for the purpose of this, I think about economic and macro risk, and I think about geopolitical risk. I think coming into last year, you, I would have said if I was sitting here that it felt like one of the most complex times for me personally in my 35 years of doing this. And the reason I would have said that is because there was so much uncertainty about the economy, about inflation, the trajectory of interest rates around the world, quantitative tightening, and really what all that means oversimplified is the cost of capital. And we hadn't seen the cost of capital go up really in a systematic way in global economies for decades. And so that was a huge adjustment. And I think there was a lot of uncertainty attached to that. I think geopolitical risk was clearly on the scene. I think over the past year, we're getting more clarity on the uncertainty around economic risks. The, the data is proving out to give us a case that I think, even though there's a lot of debate around consensus, I think we have our very specific views, which I'll share with you in a second, but I think geopolitical risk, obviously with the tragic situation in the Middle East uh, and Russia, Ukraine, I just think ge geopolitical risk is the highest we've seen, certainly in my lifetime, and um, unhedgeable risks make me very cautious, and it's an unhe unhedgeable risk. Uh, and uh, alarming. On the economy, you know, there's always this debate about hard landing or soft landing. I'm not sure that's really the best way to get under the hood of this. So we have almost a million employees in our portfolio companies um, in 30 plus countries. And so we have a pretty unique data set in terms of the economic activity we see. Um, Carlisle, for those you who don't know, is a, a bit over 400 billion of assets. Um, we're really known as a private equity firm, but credit is really our biggest segment now. Um, but in those portfolio data and all that data that we roll up, we can see the strength of the economy. We can see that inflation and the desire for management to raise prices that they've lost pricing power. So inflation, as we're seeing in the public data, has definitively cooled. I think if we think about the rate environment, because it gets so much attention and we'll hear from the Fed, I think that if you look at the history of what the Fed has done, it's either sort of fine tuning where you get a couple of rate cuts or a couple of rate increases, or you see dramatic moves. And I know there's sort of a general market desire for like six or eight cuts. I think that's a bad wish. Um, I think the cost of capital normalizing, and if we can navigate this and have modest cuts, I think it would be really good. I think the industry will thrive. Um, uh, but I think that sort of everybody got out a little too hooked on quantitative easing. Uh, I think it's, it's time to move away to that and move, move more towards rational capital structures. Before you had come to Carlisle, back in the last financial crisis, you had a very significant role at Goldman Sachs at the heat of the moment. And you know this was when you know, the moment that really changed the interest rate regime, right? Post 2008, there's a whole generation of investors who have not lived through that moment, that have not lived in a time where interest rates were not zero, <laughs> yeah. right? How difficult do you think that adjustment is going to be for realizing cost of capital might be a little higher than it was the last decade? So I remember I was on the, I, was, I had fantastic co-heads when we were running the trading floor. Actually, one of my colleagues is in the front row, Paul Huckrow, um, who, uh, I shouldn't do this to Paul, but you know, just to give you a sense of it, do you mind if I do this? Yeah, okay. So, uh, and again, in the heat of the moment, you could, just to give you a sense of how 
how kind of nutty it was, but everybody knows it was nutty. Uh, I was in my office, and uh, there was a long line of people outside the office because there was a lot of decisions to make. And Paul came walking in, and he said, hey, we've had a bit of a mishap. And I said, okay. He said, yeah, we lost $400 million. I go, just like now? He's like, yeah, just a few minutes ago. And he said, um, am I going to get fired? I said, no, it's fine. Go back to work. Anyway, um, sorry, Paul. <laughs> but he's an incredibly talented trader and investor. The, um, the, you know, I was on the trading floor at Goldman Sachs when they introduced quantitative easing. And I, and I remember most people were scared of it. They didn't know what it meant. A lot of people actually sold mortgages. And then very quickly people realized, oh, no, 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 you buy mortgages. And then quantitative easing, and I think the Fed did an extraordinary job creating quantitative easing. I think, of course, the problem was you had a series of events that came together between the way we adopted monetary policy. It just, we, we were nervous about quantitative easing, then we liked it, then we liked it way too much. And, of course, then the pandemic. And I think 50 years from now, when we look back at the history of finance, I think, to digress for a second, I think the kind of unfortunate timing of the smartphone in 2006, the financial crisis in 2008, and the pandemic will actually all tie together in a way that sort of set up the system and what we're now having to adjust to. And, but I think it's really important to have rational capital structures. And we haven't had a rational cost of capital determined by the market in a long time. That's going to be a complicated adjustment. But I do think for everyone in this room and for Carlo, I think it's, it will create incredible alpha opportunities over the next five, 10 years. Um, and everybody likes beta, but I think it's a huge opportunity set for everybody in this room. Now, let's talk about some of the things that are kind of setting up for the next five to 10 years. I know you don't like to talk 10 years out, but no. there's some structural changes. Uh, one of them, topic du jour, being private credit. You had mentioned that credit is now a bigger business at Carlisle than private equity. How far does that trend go? Yeah, so, um, well, we're the largest CLO manager in the world. Um, private credit's important. It's not that I don't like to talk 10 years forward. I just think, if you actually think about the debate around what the Fed's gonna do in the next six months, people can't even agree on the certainty of that. So I think actually predicting 10 years is quite a difficult thing. I think you can, again, attach yourself to some fundamental trends. And one fundamental trend, so I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, and so one fundamental trend I believe in is I think wealth creation will just continue. You know, despite all the reversal of some of the mega trends that really drove the world for the last 30 or 40 years and took billions of people out of poverty, I think, I think wealth accumulation in the world will continue. And that means that as businesses grow, they need more capital. I think the trend towards fewer public companies probably continues. And I think as providers of capital, our role will get increasingly important. And when you think about what's been happening with banks and bank regulations, I think that trend is locked in place for the foreseeable future. Now, how that plays out. Now, I know private credit gets a lot of attention. Sometimes private credit gets attention because they talk about it being systemically risky. And again, I think that's a bit, um, it's good for headlines. I don't think that it's uh, a rational framework. So if you want to think about risk um, and where historically you've seen real problematic risk, it sometimes, not always, has at least three characteristics. It has concentration, it has leverage, and it has interconnectivity. That's really how you get systemic risk. And if you think about what we all do here, uh, by the way, our team is here. I don't know where Alex is who runs, where's Alex? Alex uh, Popoff, who runs a big part of our credit business, Shane. Um, I think they saw there was like 15,000 meetings here. I think between Shane and Alex, they should have about 5,000. Um, so that's why I point them out. Um, so you can find them in the booth across the way. No, but it, when you think about s what, what do you need for the kindling of systemic risk? Concentration, leverage, interconnectivity. It's not the business we're in. Leverage is low. The liability structures are really fantastic. You can't have a run on the bank. Um, we don't have concentrated positions because by definition, part of our responsibility is diversification across a portfolio of assets and asset allocation, and we're not interconnected. So I think some of this discussion about our shadow banking uh, 
it's just a bit exaggerated and misunderstood. So I think the industry continues to grow because we're just we're the best marginal providers of capital. It still begs the question, as so many new players enter the market, what kind of mistakes will they make? So that, I think, is fair. I think history has shown whenever a lot of capital rushes to a space, I think you can get distorted pricing, and I think you can get marginal pricing which because you have increased competition. Um, and that can lead to something, and that's, that's to be looked at. But I don't think you're seeing that because the demand for capital is so significant at this stage. I think the, again, I think the headlines are disproportionate to the reality. It's an incredibly important business for us, and it's one of many significant growth areas for us, and we have a fantastic team. But I think the way we should think about this in terms of if we're stepping back and we're thinking about sort of risk in the marketplace, I think if you didn't have private credit right now, who would be the marginal capital providers? Who would be helping companies grow? As, as credit, as, as the cost of capital goes up, and companies need to refinance, who's gonna provide that capital? In, if you think about, so this is a statistic most people here probably know, but roughly give or take, um, a third of the public companies in the United States are cash flow negative in the last 12 months. The last time you saw statistics like that was back in 2000. Why does that make sense? You had that big ramp up of IPO activity a couple years ago, SPACs, but IPO activity is not a bad thing. IPO activity happens because companies need capital. And then of course, they weren't that levered, but you get this massive rate shock. And of course, it now consumes a lot of cash out of the capital structure. Who's the provider of that capital to take those great companies and help them keep growing? We are. And so I think it's a really important role in finance. And for sometimes something that gets referred to as the shadows, it gets more discussion and light on it than anything I've ever seen. So I suspect, um, but the discussion's healthy. I welcome it. It also begs the question, you know, we talk so much about private credit in this industry these days. What does it mean for traditional private equity anymore? Is it well, I think it's, I think it's completely complementary because if you think, let's take a, like an example, um, Recently, some of you may have seen, um, we sold our interest in McDonald's. Uh, it got a lot of headlines because it was nearly a seven times multiple on the investment. Fantastic team, our Asia team's been in this business for a couple of decades. Um, what allows that business to be seven times growth? Great partner, great brand. Um, but if I said, if I did a random thing and I said, hey, everybody raise your hands, how much value creation do you think came from leverage, financing tools, most people think about private equity and say, oh, the vast majority. The reality is when you break down the build for the value creation across five and a half, six years for McDonald's in China, it's actually around 15% came from financing. So what do we do in private equity? What we really do is we work with management teams, we work on operational capabilities, we work on strategy, we add value, and financing is an important component of that because that's the kindling. And so I think in our private credit business, you know, if you're talking to Alex, part of his opportunity set is to help great companies that are private recapitalize. And in private equity, I think, I think the, you know, you know, 10 year predictions I won't make, but I'll tell you, I think the private equity is gonna be much bigger in 10 years than it is today. Um, a lot of that's because of what'll happen with wealth around the world that want access to those returns. Um, but there are great, great companies that because of this rate shock will need to be recapitalized. That can come in the form of equity, it can come in the form of debt, but that's where we can bring these things together and be a solution provider. Well, it's funny because of the thing I was gonna ask you with the cost of capital being higher, some can argue that the golden age of private equity is over. Would you agree with that? No, I would say the golden age, you could argue then that the golden age of every asset class is over. So. Again, not to like get dragged into a corporate finance discussion um, at the risk of being super boring, but um, hey, the treasury curve is the risk-free rate of the world, and everything is priced off the, off the treasury curve at the end of the day. If you really want to be a purist and sort of first principles about corporate finance, if the treasury rate is, is actively but openly manipulated, it drives down the cost of capital for every asset class in the world. It doesn't matter, mortgages, cars, homes, every curve in the world. So that's why I believe fundamentally as a market participant that in a very orderly way, it's better if the cost of capital normalizes wherever that should be. 
Now, if you have easy money, obviously you can use that as a different sort of part of the toolkit. But as the cost of capital goes up, as I said, like take the McDonald's example, 15% or so of that value creation came from financing. It's not how you get a near seven times return on an asset. You get that again, good partners, really, really fantastic business plan, right demographics, that's what you have to do to create value. So as the cost of capital comes up, I'll, I'll give you my sense of what I think happens. I think private equity returns continue to outperform over a long cycle like they have, but I think you'll see capital structures that are not as levered. You'll see more equity in transactions. I think you're going through a price adjustment now and you'll see companies do more carve outs. And so I think the opportunity set shifts. But if you look, for example, we've been in this business for 35 years. If you look at the history of that particular segment of our business, private equity at Carlisle, we generate our best returns in these kinds of environments, historically. So you mentioned something a couple times and this idea that the world is gonna get wealthier and that wealthy individuals will want more assets like private equity funds, private equity assets. Private credit, private right. equity, I think it's a natural transition. What's driving that and how difficult is it to get people to see the paradigm shift here? Well, I don't think it's difficult for people to see it because it's not driven from people like you and me on a stage. It's driven from their own need and their own desire. It's no different than evolutions in other markets as investors, wealthy investors, retail investors have access to things. And so in this world, there's so much transparency and people can get educated so quickly. It's very easy for people to see the value in having a diversified portfolio of assets. The key for us in this industry is to get it right. And so if there's something we're doing in credit, for example, our CTAC, which is basically the best of credit at Carlisle, a diversified strip, um, if we have that, it's our obligation to work with the providers, because we don't cover the wealth directly, um, and one of the big wirehouses and platforms, we have to make sure we work with them to make sure that it ends up in the right hands. And that's what I think over the next five or 10 years is the paramount responsibility of everybody in this room is to make sure that we make sure we all collectively deliver to those clients. But again, this trend will continue because the diversification makes sense. You have your choice between stocks, bonds, emerging markets, S&P 500, ETFs, debt, all part, the whole full toolkit of investing choices should be made available. I guess that's why they call it democratization, although there was no restriction. Um, but I just think it's a natural evolution. It's not gonna stop. These are certainly topics of the day, and the, the other big one is artificial intelligence. Yeah. You know, you've given me some interesting examples over time about how you've started to use it at Carlisle and portfolio companies and the difference it's made. What about this next generation of AI? What will it do for you? So I think that, um, of all the trends that I talked about, the one I didn't mention before was the trend in technology, which is only accelerating now. The others are generally reversing or slowing. And in technology, I think we can look back and see step functions, right? Like um, mainframe, PC, web, smartphone, AI, okay? And I'll tell you, as, a, as the CEO, I view it through uh, three strategic lenses. One is how can we work with our investing teams to make sure they have all the best technology to make the best investing choices? That's one. The second is how can we deliver it to our portfolio companies and help our portfolio companies leverage our collective resources? Because at our scale, we can have the investment in AI. Um, we have a partnership with OpenAI. You've probably seen it. And also, as a CEO, how can we make Carlisle better? Now, me, I think, somebody asked me in Davos, um, I was at a, a round table, and uh, Fareed said, Fareed Zakari was hosting, and he said, hey, um, how many people think it's hype, AI? And I said, it is overhyped. That doesn't mean it's not real. But for me, it's all about use cases. Because you can have enthusiasm for something that you can't quite quantify um, the KPIs and the output. So for me, it's all about use cases. 
And so as the CEO, that's what I want to see. I want to see very specific use cases. Some of them, people will say, well, look, we believe the use case has this outcome. We can't guarantee it. That's fine, too. But sort of understanding the application, but I think it's super early days. But we're already seeing the benefits in some of our portfolio companies where the deployment is making the company better perform for their customers, more efficient, universally better outcomes. And again, I think it's super early days. Almost a year, almost a year into your time at Carlisle, we kind of started this conversation talking about your very non-traditional background. Yeah. And you know, it begs the question. No, he's not so traditional. You know, she's a Jersey girl. Oh yeah. You know, did you did Shaq's, Shaq's from Jersey? Shanali's from Jersey. I'm from Jersey. That's why we did the Jersey shot in the it's back. It's the secret to success. C clearly, Shanali. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it, it does beg the question: as you're thinking about the future of Carlisle, the people you want to work there, the people that work. You said almost almost a million people work at the portfolio companies that you own. How do you think about talent moving forward? So I've gotten the talent question a lot over the years, and I think. Um, this is what I've, I've, I've sort of observed. I think that, well, first of all, everyone in this room fits the prerequisites for this industry, which is you have to be smart, you have to be willing to work hard. It's too competitive um, to not be. I think the third component is level of care. Level of care, I think, in some respects can be taught. I think if you grow up in an institution and you're surrounded by people that have a really, really high level of care, for each other, for their clients, for the outcome, for compliance and policy. I think it just can be part of who you are as you evolve as a professional. Uh, I'm not sure it can always be taught. If it hasn't been learned, I think it's very difficult to teach. Um, I, think it's, I think it's hard to unlearn bad practices. But the last one I don't think can be taught, which is creativity. I think certain individuals are just incredibly creative. Paul is creative. Um, and great to work with, and a fantastic partner. Um, and had all those elements, by the way. But um, you can't teach creativity. But when I think about the organization, the organization can be creative. Like with the right focus, a real uh, set of priorities, encouraging execution, excellence, and teamwork, teamwork can create creativity. And so that's how I think about the culture, but I'm also, you know, my f the founders of the company created an incredible culture. Um, David, Bill, and Dana, they've been great to work with, um, great partners, become friends. I think that um, I'm just lucky to have, you know, it's just a privilege to have the seat. But I, I work with some great people. But they've now given you the keys to the castle. And so if you think about the next 10 years of Carlisle, your favorite question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how is the biggest way you think it'll change? What do you wake up every morning trying to achieve? Yeah, so because I don't believe in 10 years, I'll just say I, I think global domination. Um, <laughs> but I think that, um, I think it's actually the things I just said. I think it's about focus, excellence of execution, and teamwork. And I think it is all about executing day to day. And I think what we want to be is the best provider of returns to our constituency and we want to provide everyone at the firm with the greatest possible opportunity to achieve their dreams, their dreams professionally. And maybe some of that sounds a little bit too uh, optimistic, but it's truly how I believe. I think if we can do all that, and Carlisle is an extraordinary place. Um, you know, for the power that Carlisle has and the 400 billion plus assets, you know, we're 2,100 people. So we can do a lot because we can be nimble, we can be creative, um, we have fantastic teams. So I'm pretty optimistic. Um, I think 10 years, yeah, global domination. <laughs> Harvey, thank you. Excited to be here too, let alone your 10. Okay, great. Interview. Thank you very much. Great to be here, everybody.